Today is Sumail Hassan's birthday. Sumail is probably one of the most interesting 18-year-olds you've never heard of. Last year, Sumail was named by Time Magazine as one of the top 30 most influential teens. The reason Sumail was on that list was because he is one of the best Dota 2 players in the world. If you're not familiar with Dota 2, it is one of several online video games where professional teams compete for fame and fortune. Sumail started playing Dota 2 when he was seven, when he was living in Pakistan. He didn't have his own computer, so what he would do is pile up on a motorbike with his cousins and his friends to go to the local internet cafe to play. Despite these circumstances, Sumail got so good at the game that he was recruited by a top American esports team when he was 15. By the time he was 16, he became the youngest player to earn more than $1 million in prize earnings. And a big part of that earnings was for winning the Dota 2 World Championship in 2015. His team won $6.6 million for winning first place. And the future Olympians of tomorrow will include esports players like Sumail, not because esports is a sport of the future, but because esports is a sport of today. Today, professional teams are competing for millions of dollars in front of millions of fans. Today, professional esports tournaments are being played at marquee stadiums like Madison Square Garden in New York City, Staples Center in Los Angeles, and the Bird's Nest in Beijing. Today, there are more than 30 sports organizations globally involved with esports, including teams such as the Philadelphia 76ers, a basketball team in America, and Manchester City, a football team in the English Premier League. These sports organizations and their billionaire team owners are getting involved with esports because they know that there are more people watching and playing esports than ever before. Meanwhile, traditional sports have been declining on both fronts. Summer Olympic ratings down 15%. The National Football League regular season ratings down 9%. English Premier League down 19%. Not only are people watching sports less, people are playing sports less. In the United States over the past few years, there are millions of fewer children actively playing team sports. And one reason why people are watching and playing sports less is because it is, very, it is becoming very expensive. ESPN, which is the top American sports cable channel, is on track to pay $7.3 billion for rights this year. That's more than any other company in America. Meanwhile, they've lost 9 million subscribers since 2013. For sports participation, 38% of families earning less than $25,000 participate in team sports, while children from families uh, earning $100,000 or more, 67% of those families participate. Another study shows that up to 10.5% of a family's gross income could be spent on sports. So for a typical family earning the medium income in America, they could be spending up to $5.8,000. Besides financial considerations, some people and institutions believe that esports is actually taken away from uh, sports viewership and participation. And, and they are right. In this study conducted by NewZoo, 76% of esports enthusiasts say that the time they spend watching esports is taken away from the time they would spend watching sports. And that makes a lot of sense because younger generations are growing growing up in front of computers and other devices rather than a television. And when we look at uh, digital hours watched, esports far eclipses traditional sports. When we compare the Super Bowl, which is one of the largest sporting events in the world, with the League of Legends World Championship, which is the biggest esports event in the world, the numbers are amazing. You know, 43 million people unique viewers watched the League of Legends finals compared to less than 5 million for the Super Bowl. 
And it's not just about watching main tournaments. On one platform, Twitch, there are over 100 million people who tune in every month to watch their favorite players and influencers practice and play. So this image is of a player, a Korean player named Faker, who is often, often called the Michael Jordan of esports. His opponents and his fans alike call him God. And uh, last month, 245,000 people tuned in to watch God practice. So for context, that's like saying for your favorite athlete, whether it's a football player or a basketball player, you would rather watch him or her practice than compete against an actual team. And that's part of the reason why the esports audience continues to grow, because you're not just watching matches, you're watching people practice and just having fun. Newsu estimates that there are 385 million people who will watch esports this year. That number will grow to 589 million by 2020. Another interesting thing about esports audience is that not only do they watch, they also play. So for League of Legends, which we mentioned earlier, there are more people who play League of Legends than the amount of people who live in Germany, France, or the United Kingdom. It's clear that esports is here and esports is big. Thomas Bach, who is the president of the International Olympic Committee, says he wants to bring sport to the youth because they have a lot of other options and he cannot expect that they will come to sports or come to Olympics. Mr. Bach is right, and I believe the sport that we should take to youth is esports. But before we get there, there are three hurdles we must overcome. The first hurdle is shelf life. When you think about traditional sports, it lasts forever. You can play soccer forever. But esports, at its core, are video games that are created and maintained by private game developers. Uh, however, that trend has begun to change as well. Historically, game developers would develop a game, put it in a box, and sell in a store. And as a customer, I would go in and pay up front, enjoy that experience, and then come back next year for the second version. However, now games are being developed as a service, so game developers wish to update them constantly to keep gamers hooked for a longer period of time. And for Steam, which is the largest distribution platform for online video games, we saw that in 2016, 50% of their top games were created before 2016. One of these games is Counter-Strike, and the last image you saw was what it looked like back in 1999. This is what it looks like today. So there has been a lot of incremental improvements over the past 18 years. Meanwhile, Counter-Strike is, is as popular as it has ever been. Last month, there were more than one million people who tuned in to watch a Counter-Strike tournament. The second hurdle is organization. Organization is very important to the International Olympic Committee. That is why sports such as snowboarding had to align themselves with the International Ski Federation. And that's why sports such as BMX had to align themselves with the International Cycling Union. Well, we've got a problem in esports because there are no comparable organizations we can belong to, so we have to start from scratch. On the national front, we could look at South Korea as a model. In 2000, South Korea formed the organization called the Korean Esports Association, also known as KESPA. KESPA has really grown and evolved with the Korean esports ecosystem. So they do a variety of things. First, they preserve competitive integrity. They actively litigate against match fixers and cheaters, and they have the ability to ban players for life. Second, they work with game developers to promote quality of life for Korean esports players. So in Korea, uh, esports, professional esports players are guaranteed minimum salaries and they have a minimum one year contract. The third thing that KESPA does is they regulate internet cafes to combat internet addiction as well as to promote the amateur Korean esports scene. On the international front, the International Esports Federation, IESF, was formed in 2008 with the goal to make esports officially a sport with the Olympics. And they've done a lot of work like KESPA over the past few years. There are 46 member countries, 22, members, 22 member countries recognize esports as a sport today, and the other 24 are in the process of doing so. 
Last year, IESF petitioned the International Olympic Committee to recognize it as the official organizing body for esports. The third and uh, most interesting hurdle is the perception that esports requires little to no physical activity. Like many of you, as a sports spectator, I, I grew up thinking that all athletes need to look something like this. So I was really focused on just the body. But esports, like sports, involves body, will, and mind. And, but we'll just cover the body first because uh, many people expect you know, athletes to have muscle. And this is one of my former players, uh, Grayson Gilmer. Grayson Gilmer was a, a former football player in high school from Texas before he joined our team as an esports player. And as you can see, his biceps are bigger than my head. So uh, you know, if muscle or physical fitness is a criteria for you, then we have that in esports. But I'll be the first to admit that not every single player in esports looks like Grayson today, but the trend is going towards more physical fitness because esports athletes only care about one thing. They care about winning, and physical fitness helps them accomplish that. Finally, you know, esports athletes and just gamers in general are no longer the nerds that are hiding around in their parents' basement. They look like this today, and I think uh, this is a good image that conveys what they look like. Since we're talking about the Olympics, it's also important to feel or to understand what Olympic athletes think about esports athletes. Michael Phelps, who has won 23 gold medals, calls esports athletes, quote, his fellow athletes. And he believes that the skill, training, and, and devotion required to become uh, an esports athlete makes them athletes as well. I agree with Michael Phelps, and I saw firsthand how much work it took to become an esports athlete when I had my own esports team, Ember. I formed Ember with my co-founder back in 2015 uh, with, with the idea that we want to put as much infrastructure and, and support behind the players, much like what you would see in traditional sports organizations. So here's what we did on the body, will, and mind side. For body, we hired Ryan Swayze, who is a, a personal trainer in Los Angeles. And Ryan, for fun, likes to run through fire. Uh, and here's a short clip of what he helped our, our team did. What they're doing is creating a sound body, mind, and spirit. On your belly. Oh, oh my God. All the way up. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Breaking up the stigma of classic gamer just eating Cheetos and drinking Mountain Dew all day. So our, our players at first, they, they doubted the physical training. But when, once they started winning games, they incorporated physical training into their own routines because they just, they just care about winning. For mind, and, uh, for mind and Will, we had a combination of help from Jonathan Carter and Walden Green. Jonathan Carter on the left, he is a certified instructor in the United States Army's Master Resilience Trainers course. Resilience is very important in esports because the matches are mentally exhausting. Mark Cuban, who is the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, calls esports five-dimensional chess. So just as how he trained soldiers and soldiers' families to cope with deploy deployments and to develop resilience, he helped our players do the same. Walden Green helped us create a high-performance environment because esports is not about just clicking your mouse or your keyboard faster to win. Esports is, requires a lot of strategy and, more importantly, real-time strategies to, to win. So Walden focused on that for us through goal setting as well as player communication. Our team trained 9 a.m. often until midnight, five to six days a week. And all of this training is why the United States started offering athletic visas for certain esports athletes. All of this training is why Michael Phelps calls esports athletes his fellow athletes. And all of this training is why esports should be at the Olympics. So what's next? How do we get there? The first step is the International Olympic Committee should recognize IESF as the official organizing body for esports. Second, it would be tremendously helpful if Los Angeles was selected as the, the host city for the 2024 Olympics. And I'm not just saying that because I'm from there. Los Angeles uh, has a unique abundance of infrastructure and talent for esports competitions. 
because some of the top game developers and top esports teams are located in Los Angeles. Also, uh, esports is incredibly popular in Southern California, and having locally popular youth-oriented sports increases the chances of them being added to the Olympics, which is why we saw karate, uh, baseball, and skateboarding added to Tokyo Olympics. So if you agree with me, here's how you can help. Go to change.org, search for eSports Olympics, and sign my petition. With your help, we can bring eSports to the Olympics and to really leverage this global phenomenon in a positive way to improve body, will, and mind for millions of young people around the world. Thank you.